Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I hope you have a great day. I miss you so much. I love you. Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Thank you for everything you do for us. Love you. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mommy. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I wish I was there with you in Connecticut and could hug you and be with you on this day. And I love you a lot. Hope your day is great. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's day. day. We love you and thank you for everything you do for us. Happy Mother's Day! Well, hello once again, everybody. It's an absolute delight that you're here today. If it's your first time here watching with us at Cornerstone, I want to welcome you. My name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church on this wonderful Mother's Day. And I am just so delighted to have my favorite mother in the entire universe. That's right, my wife, Sandra Bucci, who's right here. She is the most amazing mom and an amazing wife. We've been married almost 20 years now be coming up in June. Yep. And uh, she's done an amazing job mothering our children. I wanted to say to you, Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. You're an amazing mom. Thank you, honey. Appreciate and it. It really is. One of the sentences in the book of Proverbs that it's an amazing to see a mom with his children. It's true. I mean, she has a connection with the children I just don't have. And she's an amazing mom. And we're just so appreciative for her. And I just want to thank God for all the moms out there. And I also want to let you know something, everybody. No matter what you're going through, realize this that you are precious to God. And I understand there's some moms out there, you're not able to be a mom, but you know what? God's given you a maternal love. And you can be a surrogate in many ways to other people that don't have moms. Mm -hmm. That you can be a blessing to other people. I wanna let you know that. That God is all about us working together. Everyone has something they can bring that someone else cannot bring, no matter what stage of life you're in. And I think one of the biggest problems we have, Sandra, is that a lot of times people are dissatisfied because they're not mothers. Mm -hmm. and then when they're mothers, they're dissatisfied because the kids are not out of the house. And it's always something people are complaining about. This is what I want to encourage people to do. Embrace where you're at. The Apostle Paul says, I've learned a secret to be content no matter where I'm found. And right now, we're going through a, a series of difficulty with this pandemic. And this whole series is gain by pain. And today we're gonna to talk about something, being unshakable. That's right, being unshakable. And one of the ways we're unshakable is that we stay connected to God and to each other. And so I wanted to share with you a few things. First of all, staying connected with each other. If you wanna take a screenshot of this, on Tuesday through Friday, we're having a live broadcast here, live at noon from the living room. It goes from 12 to about one or so, Tuesday through Friday, that's happening right here. Our small groups are still meeting and we wanna make some extra small groups, we can. And you can do that by going to um, Pastor Rich at cornerstonecheshire.com. If you have any needs or wanna know more information, you can go to Janine at cornerstonecheshire.com. And finally, we're doing something new, it's texting. We can actually text to go to a connection card. And this is an easy thing to do. All you gotta do is put 94090, put begin, and we'll bring you to a virtual connection card where you can connect to whatever you need at that moment. That's what's gonna be happening, okay? But I wanna get back to our message today. As we're talking about what it is to deal with this, how can we become unshakable, unmovable, that no matter what you and I are going through, we can stay strong? And I think one of the ways we can do that is by knowing that moms are awesome. Which reminds me of a story. Can I tell a story? Here it goes. There are these three men that are trying to get past this raging river. And so they're on a expedition together and they're praying. And there's three guys. One guy prays, God, give me the strength to, to be able to swim across this river, this raging river. And all of a sudden, boom, he gets these strong arms and strong legs. And it takes him two hours to, to swim across the river. The second guy goes, wait a minute here. I know what I need. I need not only strength, but I need the tools. So he says, God, give me both the strength and the tools to know how to get across this river. And all of a sudden, boom, he gets the big muscles and arms, and then he has a toolbox. And what he does, he actually makes a canoe. It only takes him 30 minutes to get across the raging river. The third man thinks to himself, wait a minute, guy asked for strength and tools. I'm gonna ask God, give me strength, tools, and the wisdom to know what to do, boom. He becomes a mom. He turns him to a mom. You know what he does? He opens the map up, figures out, figures out there's a bridge a mile down the road, takes the car, drives down a mile down the road, and does it in two minutes. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think that's pretty fun. <laughs> Uh, it's amazing. It is amazing how awesome moms are. And I, I just thank God that I can't imagine raising our children mm -hmm. without us working together. Thank you for being an amazing mom once again. And, and today what we want to be able to do in this Mother's Day is talk about how we can become unshakable during these difficult times. And I'm going to go ahead and look at some scriptures. And the one thing I want to ask us as all of us is this. What is God saying to us? You see, God is speaking right now. Whether you recognize it or not, he's speaking to us. I think it's always important to ask God, what are you doing right now in our lives? What are you saying to us as families? What are you saying to us as a church? Mm -hmm. And I believe God is, is saying a couple things to us. I wanna share with you today, and Sandra and I are gonna kinda, kinda bounce off each other throughout our time here today, but I just wanna encourage you to know that God indeed is speaking. I like what C.S. Lewis says, everybody. This is what he says. God whispers to us in our pleasures speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Think about it. Are we not, has our attention not been captured? I mean, the whole world, I don't think this has ever happened before in the history of man, that the entire world at the same time has all been disrupted. And that's what this pandemic is doing. Mm -hmm. The question is, God, what are you saying through this? We don't want to miss it. We want to, through this pain, we want to gain, become more like you, God. And I think that's what God would have us to do. And I want to look at some scriptures today and what the Bible says, how we can be unshakable. And we're going to look at the book of Hebrews today. Also look at Romans and also look at the book of John. So before we do that, I want to bring you to Hebrews 12, 25. And let's go ahead and read this together, okay? I'm going to stand up because I'm Italian. I like to stand. All right, here we go. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Who is speaking? God is speaking. Don't refuse what God is speaking. God is moving. God is talking. God is communicating to us. And I don't know about you, but I want to hear his voice, right? For if they do not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Now, what's he talking about here? You'll see the context in a few moments. This is talking about when the Israelites were at a mountain. They were at the mountain of God. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago and God revealed himself and God said to them, Moses told the people, do not be afraid of God, but fear God, right? And he, began, he gave the 10 commandments. He gave them the law and all that. Well, now Jesus, a better way has come, Jesus Christ. And don't reject what Christ is saying, is what this is talking about. Here we go to our basic thing. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but will shake the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So everything that will be shaken will be shaken. Have you noticed how everything indeed is being shaken, everybody? I don't know, have you noticed how things are really being shaken, how things are falling apart all around? And what remains is what's important. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, and we don't realize that, what is being shaken in our lives and what remains? If nothing else remains, then what have we been building our lives upon? I think of a shaking of a tree and all the fruit falls off and there's nothing left. But when everything is shaken, what is remaining in our lives is what's really, really important as we look at these scriptures. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. How can you and I, how can we be unshakable? Unshakable. You see, it says in Hebrews 12, 26, same context here. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Listen, everybody, if we are building our lives on the kingdom of God, it's unshakable, it's unmovable. If we find ourselves being shaken, then the question is, what are we living our lives upon? And one thing we can be seeing on our Tuesday through Friday times, we've been talking to people around the world and everyone's saying the same thing, that we have to find a solidarity, we have to find our foundation. So, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, everybody. Listen, we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. No matter how bad it gets, the best days are always ahead. No matter how bad it gets, Christ Amen. won the decisive victory 
on the cross. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship that in the middle of this, everybody, I don't care how bad it's getting. Say, I thank you, God, that your kingdom is unshakable. If everything that you're going after is shakable, there's a problem. And I think part of the problem is this, Sandra. I think part of the problem is we've told everybody, give your life to Jesus. You'll have a better marriage, better kids, more money in the bank. Everything's going to be great. Jesus did not die on the cross to give us a better marriage, to give us more money in the bank, to give us more happiness in this life. No, Jesus came as a savior because there's eternity is coming. One day, all of us are gonna have to answer how we lived our lives. Mm -hmm. And Jesus loves us so much that he died for us. Mm -hmm. And so if we base our life upon the things of this earth and Christianity is based upon what God can give me through the church, through the Bible, then when it all goes away, what do we have? Where's God? We missed the point. And listen, I'm a little uncomfortable too. I'm feeling the shaking. Whoa, what am I standing on? What am I looking on? Jesus talked about the person that built his house in Matthew chapter seven, on the rock and on the sand. And my friends, whatever is being shaken, this is an opportunity for us. God is doing something great here. You see, be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and let us offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence. Understand, we should have fear for God, reverence and awe, which is fear. Godly fear, everybody. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, I know this doesn't really fit very well with the vernacular of Western Christianity where God's my best friend and he loves me and it makes no difference what you do as long as you're all about love. No, there is a day, everybody. And I'm not saying that because I like it. There's a day we're going to have to answer for our lives. And God's default setting, God's default setting is love and grace. That's right. At the core of God is love. At the core of God is his love for you and his love for me. And everything he does is out of love, including punishment at the end of the age. That's right. And so how does that all jive together? It does, everybody, because, you know, think about this for a second. When we see the injustice in our land, something cries out, it's got to be made right, right? All of us go through that. That should not be, right? We all sit there. How many times do you and I do that? Why? Because love cares. And love has to exercise justice. And so God is a loving God. He doesn't want anyone to perish. The reason you're alive today, so please understand, we're not saying it's because we want the world to go to hell. We want the adversaries of God to be destroyed. No, that's not our position. Our position is to bring the light of Jesus Christ to everybody. And I want to encourage you during these times that that we're called to do. You see, God has allowed us to enter this new season. Has he caused it? I don't think he's caused it, but I think he's allowed it. Mm -hmm. He's allowed it, everybody. Why? Because he loves us and he cares about us. Let me, let me give you a story. Um, and I didn't ask permission, but he'll get over it. <laughs> and this is the story. My brother David, who is older than me by seven years, so he's about 28 years old, He's older than me by seven years. We, we used to live in a, in a place in Yonkers, New York, and I'm not going to mention people's names, but my brother liked to shoot off his mouth. He'd go around the neighborhood, call people's names, mm -hmm. get on his little banana seat bicycle and run back home, shut the door, get out of trouble, and then the kids would come. And the next thing you know, the kids started egging our house. They started throwing, they got the hose, and they put it on our porch and flooded our porch, and they started causing us all sorts of trouble. And it was because my brother had a big mouth and would antagonize the neighbors. <laughs> it got to such a point, my dad said, stop it. And my brother David would not listen. So once again, my brother David kept doing what he's doing. And so David, I'm sorry, get over it because you teased me all my life. It's my turn now. So, <laughs> so one day he was teasing these guys, right? And he runs back home. He's going to get into the door and shut it. And my dad closes the door, goes click and locks the door. My brother's like, let me in, let me in, right? He's just screaming, let me in. And my dad wouldn't do it. My mom is going crazy. Let him in, let him in. No, he needs to learn a lesson. So my dad looked through the drape and my brother got pounded. He got beat up. <laughs> now, back in those days, when you beat someone up, it was respectful. You, you knock someone to the ground, you leave them alone. Today, God knows what they would do, but they beat him up pretty good. He had a bloody nose and all that. And my dad 
kept watchful of what was going on. If the boys got out of hand or started fighting dirty, my dad would come out and stop it. But he realized that David had to learn a lesson. Mm -hmm. And sometimes parents, we coddle our kids too much and they never grow strong enough to face the real world. I believe God is utilizing this set of circumstances to make us stronger. I think we've been like my brother, that we've been playing around the street, playing with the world, playing with evil, playing with darkness, and we run back to God. God's saying, it's time for you to grow some strength. And not, did God cause us? No, but God is using this. I believe he's using this. And if you or I will, will embrace what he's doing, we're gonna become stronger. I really, really believe that. So God wants to make us unshakable by allowing a shaking. Mm -hmm. He wants to shake us up. He wants to allow it. He's allowing it, everybody. Did he cause it? What's going on? Is this the end of the age? Listen, it's not for us to know the times or the epochs that the Father has set, but this is what are we to do. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and spread the gospel. That's what it says in the book of Acts. Okay. But God wants to make us unshakable by allowing a shaking. And God disciplines those he loves. The illustration I just gave you of my brother is a good example. Not a perfect example, but a good example of what God's doing with us. I think God wants to grow us stronger. In fact, Sandra, I would say the most difficult times in probably your life and my life has been times when things got shaken, right? Yep. I think of my early 20s, my whole life fell apart. I didn't know what was going on in my life. I got shaken when you came from Columbia to the United States of America. Was that not a shaking for you? Yep, it was definitely a big change, a big, a big difference in culture. Um, just everything was new to me and just leaving uh, my country and coming here definitely uh, took me up a lot. <laughs> and, and you also said to something very careful, it took you like two, three years to find a church, right? Yeah, so um, when I came here, I really thought, oh, I'm gonna be able to find a church just exactly like the one I used to go in my country, which was, you know, amazing, I love it because I was a young adult and I had already a lot of friends. So when I came here, my expectation was like, wow, you're gonna find the same thing. But it, it wasn't the same. It actually took me two years to find a church. So- um, And what happened in those two years? So in those two years, um, it was, when I came here, it was very lonely. Um, I must say that I was pretty much isolated, almost like what we're living right now. It was a season, a season. Uh, where I, um, I, I had to depend on God. I was alone. I didn't have my core of friends. Um, I didn't have all the wonderful things that I have in Colombia. I didn't have a home. I had to live with my family, my uncles, which was a blessing, but it was not your place. Mm -hmm. uh, I also didn't have uh, a, a church to go. I couldn't attend a church because I did, first of all, I didn't know where to go, uh, what church was healthy which one was not, and I actually visited a lot of churches, and, um, and it was not the same, because here is different, and it's obvious, it's a totally different culture. So I, in those two years, it was difficult. It was two years of uh, loneliness, as it was two years of depending on God, basically uh, going after God like never before. And actually this season that we're going through mm. uh, here with the pandemic, yeah. and it reminded me a lot of when I was all by myself. I, and back then we didn't have the technology that we have nowadays to find a church, to be able to uh, you know, live stream a service. We didn't have all the wonderful technology to communicate with people all around the world. We, don't have, we didn't have Zoom, we didn't have any of that stuff. So and telephones are really expensive. Oh yeah, yeah. to make a phone call, yeah. I will have to Crazy like expensive. save money to buy a prepaid phone card to make phone calls to my friends who I miss so much. So basically it was like total, total dependency on God. I didn't have a pastor, I didn't have anything. But with all that, my main source of strength, um, my foundation became the Lord. I really, really, after perhaps maybe like being distracted a little bit, after I realized, Lord, this is a season where I'm not going back to Colombia. I'm staying here in America. So what am I supposed to do? Complain and say, oh, how miserable I'm here? No, or how I miss my country. I wish things are differently. I didn't have any chance to go back. 
I had to realize that I, this, is my, this was my home and I had to change the way I was viewing things. And it was not by myself. It was God through me showing me that he wanted me to strengthen me. He didn't want me to live like in Colombia, just going to church, maybe just, you know, it was nice because I feel like, wow, it feels like a, like a social club. It was nice to see my friends, but I was not getting grounded in my savior. And that's how I feel like right now, what we're going through, are we getting grounded in the Lord? Yes, you've been shaken, but what, what are you turning to? What are you doing that is grounding you, making uh, Jesus your firm foundation? So good. And, and so as a result of you going through that, you had to find God in a new way. Last week we spoke about making a sanctuary in your home. And that's what we're doing today, right? Yeah, we're in our homes. We're having to learn how to do church as a home. And that's, you know, church is important and, church, and the home is important. But you can't substitute the, the church with your home and nor can you substitute your home church when you live in your home with the church. We need both. And so God, through that shaking, tested you and you learned to grow. And as a result, you've you learned how to deal with these situations. There's a lot more that happened as well. It was all good. But you had to learn the language, the whole thing, right? It was, it was a real challenge. So, so that's what God disciplines those he loves because he loves <coughs> us and he wants to grow us up. Look what it says in Hebrews, same chapter here. Have you, not, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? That's right. M women and men, you're both sons. What does sons mean? In the Hebrew understanding, a son had all the rights and the benefits. So you're all sons. Galatians says there's no male, there's no female, there's no slave, there's no free. We're all one in Christ. Not in value, not in function, but in value. So you're all sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. And so is God punishing us? I don't know exactly what he's doing. I just don't know. And I wish I could tell you that, but I do know this. He wants us to grow from it hmm. and he's allowing it. Is he inside like my father looking through the curtain, seeing us getting beat up? I don't know. But do you think maybe when things are being shaken and you're freaking out and I'm freaking out, maybe we have the wrong things we're, we're holding on to? I think so. You see, for the Lord disciplines those he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children. I have no right to go to somebody's other children and start disciplining them. But God disciplines those he loves. Mm -hmm. And I think God is giving us this shaking, everybody. The Bible says judgment begins in the house of the Lord. It's time for us to re-examine what, what we're doing. It's time for us to wake up. And so God, I believe, is disciplining us. He's not sending this per se, but he's using this to grow us up. Because we know the Bible says he works all things to good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. So we can either moan and groan about this set of circumstances, get depressed, I can't wait till things come back. My friends, it's never going to come back exactly the same. I'm telling you right now, and I hope it doesn't. We need to learn and grow beyond this, everybody. Beyond this. You see, besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our own good, that we may share his what? Holiness. Now, please understand, when I say holiness, it doesn't mean holy, 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 I'm so holy. <laughs> I grew up thinking holy was boring. No. Holiness is wholeness. Holiness is wholeness. W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S. -E -S -S. Wholeness inside. That's what holiness does. It makes us whole. Holiness is God's virtue, his character, his presence. God wants us to be holy. So when there's an invitation for holiness, 
It's an invitation for life. Mm -hmm. Not a list of things you can't do, but a list of things that you can do that bring life. My friends, I'm telling you right now, holiness is an invitation for wholeness. For the, more, for, for the moment, all discipline seems painful, right? It's painful being here by yourself, right? Rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Are you being trained? You know, you think about it when you go into sports, what do they do? You do tryouts, then you make the team. What's the first thing they do? You go to training camp. Now you have to go and run six miles a day. You gotta eat, do push-ups, you gotta do all these regiments. If you join a, a basketball team or a football team in the summer, they have to get there together. They have to do all these exercises. They have these long days and they train, 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 and they have discipline. Why? Is it because the coach hates them? No. It's because the coach cares about them. And if they're gonna play the game right, they're gonna have to get strong. In fact, if a coach is not coming to you and saying, hey, you can do better than this, then think about it, parents. Parents, if you don't challenge your kids, they feel Ill illegitimate. There were times growing up, I did things bad on purpose because I wanted to be disciplined. You see, if you're not being disciplined, you're an illegitimate child. And so think about it. A good coach will push you. You can do better than this. Come on. Suck it up. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Basic training in the military. What do they break you down? They break you down so you can be whole. A horse is useless until it's broken. Are you broken before the Lord? This is part of it. Seems painful at the time. So let God train you in this time. Let him train us, everybody. Where's my job going to come from? I don't know. But when I think back about my life growing up, I've been alive long enough now to see us go through seasons where it was very difficult and God came through. You see, God wants to make us unshakable by allowing a shaking. God disciplines those he loves. It's time to wake up. Now, we have children, and uh, I'm not going to mention which ones. I'll mention myself growing up. I used to like to hit the snooze button. Hit it, hit it. My mother had to kick. Get out of bed, get out of bed. Now, we don't, it doesn't happen in our house, does it, honey? No. Everyone's up immediately. They're making breakfast. They're vacuuming the house. Uh, they're watering all the plants. It's fantastic. My wife and I get up. Here, Mom and Dad, here are your meals. They take, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> you wish. It's not that way. It's time to wake up. And honey, you know, you were mentioning this, these verses came to you, and I thought we could just kind of talk about those in the remaining time here. It says, love does no wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirements of God's law. You see, everybody, if you try so hard to live right, I can't smoke, I can't dance, I can't chew, I can't go with people who do. <laughs> when it becomes all about a do list and a do not list, it's terrible. You will drive yourself crazy, but make it your priority to fall in love with God. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to come natural. If you love me, you will obey my commandments because you'll love me. So... Love does no wrong to others. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. What does it say, honey? Wake up. Wake up. What do you think God's saying here through that? So basically um, what they're saying there is uh, we know that the second coming of the Lord is coming. Uh, and as children of God, uh, you know, it, it reminds me of when I was pregnant with Luke. Actually, his birthday was yesterday. And 16. when I was 16 years old, but I, when I was pregnant with him, I remember like the expectation, like, oh my goodness, we have to have the, the room ready. Yeah. We have to be ready for, you know, for, for the coming of the baby, get the clothes, do this, do that. We were expecting him with such a great joy. And it's the same thing for yeah. us as believers. Um, We've been sleeping for too long. We need to wake up. And, you know, we have a lot of people, like this is something that I feel like the Lord was saying too, because we have so many people saying, wake up calls about, you know, what we need to do in the healthcare system, uh, as parents, as these, as the yeah. other. But mm. what about our spiritual uh, side where we need to wake up? Because we are sleeping as believers and we need to be ready because the Lord is coming. I mean, we don't know when he's coming because the, the word says that he comes as a, uh, a thief in the night. 
But I asked myself that question, and I know my husband, and, and, and he's been preaching you know, so much about it, about being as ready. Um, are we ready? You, myself, all mm, of us, yeah. as believers in Christ, are you ready? So that's the wake up call. Mm. The wake up call for this season is to stop sleeping. For our salvation is near now than we first believe. He is coming. And he is either he's coming or either he's going to take us, either, you know, because we never know when the Lord is going to call us right. home. So we always have to be or ready. Or we'll die. Exactly. <laughs> Isn't exactly. That, uh, well, thank you so or much dead. for coming to church today. Well, <laughs> it's just the truth, everybody. You don't know when the time is. Are you ready? Right. Are you ready? And if we keep on wake, if we don't wake up, we're going to miss it. How about this? How about, how about dying? You go to heaven, but you found out you missed the opportunity to make a difference. That you could have done so much more. There was a great movie called Schindler's List, and Schindler at the end of the movie says, I could have saved so many more. Don't waste your life. This is a great opportunity to wake up. Time is running out. Mm -hmm. Wake up. Could this be the end of the age? I don't know, but it's time to wake up, is it not? Absolutely, it's time to wake up. You see, the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove, what are we supposed to do to wake up? Here's, here's the, here is the subscription, or here's prescription, excuse me. Subscription for the prescription, which is this. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes. That's right, we have to take off the dirty clothes. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they were naked. They had to put on the garments of God. Mm -hmm. They tried to hide with fig leaves. What are we hiding from? So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on shining armor. What's the armor of God? Breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, gospel of the peace of, of shoes, gospel, the peace of shoes you put on, right? All these things, the shield of faith, all these things. We are so what? Put on the shining armor of righteousness, right living. When you live right, everybody, it protects your heart. Yeah, and I... Also wanted to add that um, they're saying there <clears throat> about put on. And, you know, sometimes our identity, I feel like a, a lot of that also has to be with who, how, how are we seeing ourselves? Our identity comes from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I know, I, I, I know there is another part of that scripture because, you know, you are children of light because we belong to the day. We belong to the Lord. We must live decent lives mm -hmm. for all to see. We are not children of the darkness. No. We are children of light. And therefore, that's the way, uh, you know, we, we ought to live our lives shining the Lord. Um, and I know this is kind of a silly illustration. If you don't well, mind, really Hey, quickly. I do it all the time, so go ahead. So when he says, put on. So I'm a respiratory therapist. I put on my uniform. I have my badge. I put on my uniform. I'm not going to do it right now, right? So that identifies me as a healthcare worker. And I'm in the hospital, and I'm in a different mode. I'm not a man mode. So I'm a respiratory therapist. Now, hold on. Sorry. This is what we need to do, people. We need to put on, the word is telling us, put on. Basically, you dress up every day with what God is calling you to do. I know it might be silly, but what is God saying about you? He says that you're righteous, that you're the child of God, that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, that you have been forgiven that you may, you were made with a purpose, that you were washed clean. And it says, the word says, cast off. Basically, get rid of anything that is in the dark and put on Christ. Your identity comes from the Lord Jesus. And this is just a silly illustration, but basically how you put on Jesus is every day. Every day you practice. You said to yourself, how will Jesus act? How will Jesus think? How would Jesus behave? How would Jesus speak? 
So that's putting on Christ. So I don't know. I, to me, that spoke to my heart. So I don't know. That's awesome. You know, putting on something and taking off, taking off the dirty clothes and putting on righteousness. The thing of the matter, we don't have to make the clothes. The clothes have been made for us. Right. Putting on God's robes of righteousness. And you know, the Bible says here, do not participate in the darkness. I th I'm afraid a lot of people are participating in darkness right now, trying to deal with the anxiety. How about Netflixing, binging? Are you watching stuff that's like bad, that's going to fill your mind with junk? Listen, I'm not here to tell you what to watch, but is it glorifying God? Are we looking at things? Are we, are we getting drunk? Are we getting high on drugs? I, I don't know what's going on with you because we all come to church all happy. But what's going on in the, really in the recesses of your mind? Do not participate in the darkness. Why? Because darkness leads to darkness. Now, now, that's pretty amazing. I just said that. <laughs> darkness leads to being without the light. And right. who's the light? God's the light, right? Of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity. Why do we want to fill our minds with sexual promiscuity? In a, immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. How many have any quarreling in the house right now? How about jealousy? All this is darkness, everybody. Maybe you don't struggle, struggle with drunkenness or sexual promiscuity, but how are you doing with jealousy? Are you quarreling? You see that, everybody? Those are deeds of darkness. Right. You can't pick the ones you want and forget the other ones. Right. It's all darkness, everybody. And God wants us to live in the light. He wants to have us live in his righteousness. And his holiness is being holy. That's what he wants for us. Instead... As Sandra showed us, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord. Now, let's, let's look at that presence of the Lord again. <laughs> I want to put that on again. Get it in. And say, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay? Let's clothe ourselves. Let's put ourselves on. And you know what has to happen here? I'm helping her put on her clothes. I'm helping her put, clothe herself. That she's got righteousness. She's a child. Let's clothe ourselves with God's righteous, his presence. You see, it's not the things of God, it's God himself. Don't try to be righteous without Jesus. Don't try to be holy without Jesus. It doesn't work. It does not work. That's called religion. Right. And this is why the world hates the church. We keep telling them, do this, do this, do this. No! Put on Jesus. It's his presence, everybody. It's the person of Jesus. Not the things of Jesus, but Jesus himself. You can go straight to hell having the things of Jesus if you don't have Jesus. In fact, your life will be a living hell. It doesn't work. But put on the presence of God. His presence brings us these things, everybody. And so when we seek to love God and seek to receive from him, we get everything we need. Not trying to do all these things. Please understand, I don't want you hearing a legalism here. Some of you grew up in a church, it was all about do, 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 do. And do, do, do is do, do. Okay? B, let Christ come in your lives. Let him fill you. So instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Remember, how you think, how a man or woman thinks they shall become. Be transformed, it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the renewing of your mind. In my mind, we have to renew our minds. And what are we renewing it with? Are we binging? Are we trying to escape? I'm not suggesting we can't have fun. God loves fun. He made fun. So, we have a choice. We have a choice to be broken now or crushed later. What does that mean? I want to conclude with this. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. What's the cornerstone? Jesus Christ. We build our lives upon him. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces. Listen, the only way we can change is we have to be broken. Why do you think God is breaking everything? Think about it. Entertainment's broken. Our jobs are broken. The church is broken. Our government's broken. The world's broken. Everything is broken. Why? Because God wants to bring change. And there's no change without being broken. The question is, will you and I allow the change? The 
one who falls on the stone will be broken. Fall on Jesus. Let him break you. A horse is useless until it's broken. You are useless, and so am I, until we're broken of ourselves, that we can truly become what God has created us to become. A beautiful race horse, a beautiful horse that is ridden into battle is beautiful because it's been broken. Are you broken? That God can ride in his presence in your life, in my life. The one who falls on the stone will be broken. Check this out, to pieces. So let yourself be broken. Let yourself be broken. Stop trying to patch up something that's already gone. It's gone. Find Christ. And here's this one. So, and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. So we have a choice. Either we fall on Christ and get broken or it crushes us. If you don't change, it will crush you. It will pulverize you. That's what Jesus was telling the Pharisees. He was talking to the religious leaders of their day that had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized verbatim. He's telling the church of his day, break or be crushed. My friends, now's the time to wake up. Now's the time to be broken, lest you be crushed. Are you right with God? God wants to make us unshakable. That's his bottom line. By allowing us shaking, God disciplines those he loves. And so let's take it in, in that way. It's time to wake up. And finally, it's time to repent today. Today. And what does that look like? Here it is. Repent. Repent means going this way and turning the opposite direction. It also means changing your mind. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Sins is what separates us. Sins blotted out so that times of refreshing. Do you see repentance is refreshing? God wants to bring us refreshing. May come from the what? Presence of the Lord. Notice, it's not the things of God. It's God himself. So, this is not a religious exercise for us to get a big to-do list of things that we have to check off. No. It's all about the presence of God. Surrender to Him and let Him change you. One step at a time. My friends, that's what Cornerstone Church believes. We're not a church of perfect people. We're a church of people that are surrendered, that are all in the process of it. And the presence of the Lord and that He may send the Christ appointed to you, that's Jesus. This is how we do it. Have you given your life to Jesus? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes at this time. If you want to give your life to Christ for the very first time, that's right, in your living room, your kitchen, wherever you're located, now's the time. And all you have to do is very simple. is say, God, I give up my life and I give my life to you. So if you want to repeat after me in your own heart, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. Thank you that I am forgiven, completely forgiven. And today I choose to step out of being in charge of my life. This is not my life. My life is yours. Take it completely in Jesus name. Amen. I want to pray for the rest of us. I want to pray right now that God has broken a lot of stuff here. Are you and I are going to turn away from these horrible ways? Are we going to allow God to transform us? Hey, is your life shaken? If it's being shaken and things are falling, it shows you, it shows me that a life's built upon the wrong foundation. God wants to make you unshakable. Are you unshakable? You can be. Let's work this out together, everybody. I'm on a, I'm on a journey. You're on a journey. God loves us. He wants us to be unshakable. So let's pray. Father, I pray, God, that we would become unshakable, unmovable, because that we have completely depended upon you. No longer are we going to let the things of this world be our foundation. We thank you for all the blessings. We thank you for all the wonderful things that we have. But if we don't have you, we have nothing. Lord, show us to grow us strong. In Jesus' name.